So my name is Salome Lamas and I'm here to present uh, Terra de Ninguém at Tabacalera. So I first, um, I first heard about Paulo uh, when I was in Amsterdam back then and it was through a common friend that uh, he briefly told me Paulo's story or just the main lines and I was super intrigued by it and uh, kind of thrill at the same time and I end up like asking this person if we could arrange like a get-together a meeting that I could actually propose something to Paul and for several reasons and maybe because um, this person is, is also a very special sociologist in a way and somehow it, it took us a while or it took me a while to convince that this person to present me to Paulo but what struck me first was this story and, and my desire to actually tell the story to, to other people and also the way the story got to me so I started to be interested in um, also, how do you get to a story and, and what happens when, when, when you create this chain, almost like the, um, the broken phone game, you know, when you say something, you whisper something to someone that, and it goes on and eventually something happens to the original narrative as well. Uh, regarding the setting, so it was a very long process and, and, and the film and for several reasons we came up with, with that uh, kind of uh, mise-en-scene per se. So there's the, there are several reasons for that. One had to do with the content of Paulo's story, uh, which is someone whose life or personal account uh, rhymes or is linked with, with uh, what I would say that there are key events on contemporary history, which is at the same time history that you're, you're not taught in school yet. It's not, you, you can't really go to the public library to read about those kind of matters and uh, and then of course like the story he addresses is very different from from geography to geography let's say for instance if we address the colonial uh, Portuguese past and the colonial war there is still a big taboo in Portuguese society even if all our parents and grandparents they were either born in the former colonies or they were or they fought in the war or they went involved somehow um, it's still for some traumatic for some like this lost paradise which shouldn't be reminded as well because it, it's something that it's gone or for some it's not, so, so it's something which is not addressed openly even in, in households and uh, which is so totally different from the um, from for instance my understanding of, of the Gal case and, and the way it is still uh, an open uh, wound within the Spanish democracy somehow and, and, and also with the CIA and the death squads in El Salvador so you know it I, I mean it touches things and also these countries they deal with their own history and with their own past in the very different ways and and at the same time what I realized is that uh, for me it was very important that I'm it would have been very pretentious of, of myself to actually play this authority you know and to claim that such and such event uh, happened this way um, of course, I could have gathered like other specialists. I could have gone with archive footage. I could have gone with many other strategies. But for me, what was really the interest of the film and the character itself was not, uh, of course, the way he had his story, like this, his private story, his private memory touches a bigger history. With, uh, but but also. Um, 
the way that you, you could use him to, to reflect on the limits of documentary filmmaking, on, on authority in, in non-fiction film. Um, maybe also this idea of, uh, of where is the difference between the act of storytelling and how you have to be, and Paolo was definitely, you know, as soon as I met him and, and we had this teaser or I needed to interview him so I could write a script for the actual interview with the f for the shooting, I realized that the film could survive only uh, by having him because he's charming, he knows how to tease the viewer, he's totally aware of the camera. And um, so it, it's something that you could work with him. And at the same time, going back to that idea of fact and fiction and, and how it is all part of first history, because my understanding of history and, and I guess that nowadays a lot of people would agree with that thesis is that it's it's creative writing, you know, at the same time. And and when Paolo's account and, and narrative upon these events is also, you know, a, a mixture of remembering a past event that one has lived and to share it with someone else. It has the effect of storytelling. It's like how you tell a story, how you present it almost in as a style and uh, an history uh, and and maybe by and, and how can you dissolve the borders between these three vectors and and by doing so maybe the viewer could uh, feel that he's somehow liquidating this difference between fact and fiction or maybe to put it in a different way is uh, maybe if we are Maybe if documentary filmmaking is something that we are building upon reality and maybe that, that's linked, let's say, with the dichotomy between um, like reportage, which is based on facts and literature that contains imagination. So for me, it, it is like nonfiction film is actually a combination of that. But at the same time, there is this illusion that there's this authority because the, 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 it's like we are building this wall which is based on grounded on reality but then I, I usually use this metaphor is that if you take or if you remove one or two fictional bricks of this wall then the wall will crumble down so you need these fictional bricks for the wall to stand and and that goes back to something which is really contemporary, which is the idea that nowadays it's about the make-believe, it's about plausibility, it's about uh, maybe this idea of parafiction somehow, which is, it, it's very hard to distinguish what, what it is in fact. But then what I think that happens in No Man's Land is that there is a way to address the essential. And, and going back to that idea of fact and fiction or, or true or, or, or not true is where is the answers, where, where is the essence lying? And, and I think that is something that you can feel from Paolo's narrative. So going back to your question, the idea was just to empty the frame, you know, and just to have this one-on-one um, -on -one dialogue which is forced within those five days of shooting and uh, that somehow that, that, that there's a desire that I have when I envision the film that then the projector, um, the, the spectator can project himself within the frame and be part of that conversation. And uh, so every break there's a, like a why or maybe um, you try to, to, to pose questions as well and to be part of the dialogue. So for me, the film had to be about language and it had to be about uh, Paolo's words and about how can, how can you create a display that is also empty, 
but can also allow the spectator to create all these images because as well, I mean, we all are a bit saturated by images and I really feel that the absence is way more powerful and more violent, in fact, than actually just matching accounts with with graphical descriptions of what Paulo is mentioning. When I started to make the film, there's also like a couple of brothers and sisters of the film, not only because they deal with perpetrators, let's say this way, but uh, also with um, also in terms of okay, let's focus in one character, and you know you you could name it. There's like Jim Franco's Rossi film. There's uh, there's you know there there's there was the act of killing at the same time, but then it's not not just a guy. But uh, there's the the Tritipans film with a, with the Khmer Rouge. Um, so, and they all have different strategies, I think, in the way that they... But going back to Gianfranco's uh, Rossi's film, for instance, which I think it's a brilliant film, um, there's, there's something which is said in a blow, you know, and what I realized is that Paolo wouldn't be able to actually... Even if there was a script, he would go and jump back and forth. You know, it's not about linearity, it's just about really remembering as well. And, and, and maybe trauma and the way trauma is something which is unforgettable, but at the same time, um, something that you can't really call whenever you feel like. Um, so the numbers were something that they were not originally thought as as the the display, uh, but the chapters were there already, like those five day chapters since the beginning, uh, and that there's somehow a chronology to it. But then we had to come up with with a line that even if there's like things going back and forth, even if there's a lot of contradictions that are in the film that go back to all the questions that I've addressed earlier and all the paradoxes that Paolo as a character uh, presents in the film and that's something that we even try to underline in the editing, so it's, it's right there. Um, so when we started to organize um, his speech uh, to make it more reasonable to, to, to the viewer, um, there was this very simple method that, that a lot of editors they use, which is just, you know, you have a lot of cards and post-its and, and it kind of helped that each fragment was to be numbered. You know, and there is one moment that I step in the editing room and it makes sense, you know, it's instead of just going to black, it makes sense to have a number there by some reason. And it and then you start thinking, why is the number there? And maybe it's the, num the number is there because it creates a bigger gap, a bigger stop, you know. Suddenly you, you kind of reboot for the next fr uh, fragment. And also, it has to do with that literary um, or condition or, or just asset of the film, which is that you have the chapters, uh, almost like a, a novel, you know, and then you have the, the, the numbers and maybe they're like uh, commas and full stops and can, this kind of punctuation. So... So yeah, I just finished the film and I'm, I'm just in the process of editing another one. And those were both two films that one is called El Dorado 21 that will premiere now. And it's a film that was shot in Peru in a place called La Rinconada, which is the, the highest settlement on earth uh, that basically has is um, it presents a situation where all the people that are there they're somehow related to the mining um, industry 
But let's say it's not an industry, it is something which is artisanal. It is something which is in, called informal mining, that for some is just an euphemism for illegal mining. So basically you have um, these mining pits within the glacier, uh, and when I say that the, the, the settlement or the city, because we are talking about 80,000 inhabitants, uh, it's at 5,500 meters of altitude. So it's right in the limit of, of, uh, of you being able to survive um, and breathe up there, even if at this altitude there's already a lot of... Um, on the long run that you'll suffer from being that high. But anyway, people work under the system of Cachorrillo, which is basically you work for 30 days to the house and then the house gets you a cut. So you work for free, basically. And uh, it's such a dangerous job that the people go there out of desperation and they think they will make it out. And um, But then in the end it becomes a vicious cycle, you know, and it's about, it's like lottery. It's like you think, no, this will be the last month, but it's not. So it's like you go there and you say, I'm going to be here for a month and I will go out. And then you end up being there for 20 years. And uh, so it's probably the worst place I've been ever. And I don't know. Then there's a film, so you could, you could tell it by itself. But, um, and then the other project is set in, it's called Extinction. It was recorded in, uh, in Moldova, and especially in Transnistria, which is a frozen conflict in Moldova, backed up by the Russians. And um, then we also shot in Romania, a bit in Germany. There's a scene shot in, Liz in Portugal. And it's a film that loosely will try to address identity issues and border conflicts after the fall of the wall and after the fall of Soviet Union. Um, and maybe to comment loosely on Putin's neo-imperialistic policies. And, uh, and this idea of war without war, occupation without occupation. And then uh, I'm going to Borneo in a month from now, just to see some tribes and shamans and, and to the Middle East in the summer. So, I mean, I'm a bit all over. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a, sh a short fiction film to shoot in the summer as well. So my, f my first strictly... Um, fiction. Okay. So we'll see how that comes.